Welcome back. We've been discussing Pakistan's internal war with militant groups following a growing number of deadly attacks that has rocked the nation. Joining me here in Washington is Robert Grenier, a former CIA station chief in Islamabad, and Saha Shafkat, a Pakistani activist and scholar with St. Mary's College of Maryland. Let's get back to the discussion right now. Uh, during the break, we were talking about the question of trust and the Pakistani military. Um, can the military be trusted? Well, on the question of trust, let me say that there are a couple of ways to think about it. First of all, there's a huge trust deficit between the Pakistani people and, and Pakistan at large and the United States, which is why earlier when you talked about the Kerry Luger bill, um, there's such a distrust that, in fact, the United States does care about anything other than its military objectives in Pakistan. That's one. Um, uh, with regards to the Pakistani army, um, I think that the logical conclusion is that the Pakistani army cannot be trusted. Um, it has shown uh, in terms of its handling of aid, military aid, that it has always diverted it elsewhere and, um, uh, to personal interests as well as to interests. Well, let me get this right. When you talk about it can't be trusted, are you saying that it can't be trusted because it diverts funds? Uh, or it can't be trusted because it might have secret sympathies with those that it... Both, both. I mean, the Pakistani army institutionally is completely focused on its rivalry with India. And a very big part of what's happening in Afghanistan, what's happening with the Th Pakistani Taliban right now, is about the rivalry with India. And unfortunately, we don't talk about that regional picture. Um, that's not going to change overnight. That hasn't changed, and I don't see it changing in the near future. So until uh, th that's one of the reasons why we can't trust the Pakistani army to really be uh, interested in going after the Taliban, because it continues to see them as a strategic asset. Robert, do you agree? Well, I, I think it all depends on what part of the, uh, the Taliban we're talking about. Uh, the, the Afghan Taliban is really quite a separate organization with separate interests from the, the so-called Pakistani Taliban. Uh, and yes, it's true that at the end of the day, the Pakistan army is focused on what they perceive at least to be the national interest of Pakistan. And uh, in sorting through the, their various enemies, current and potential, they're going to focus on those who threaten them in the short term, that is the, the Pakistani Taliban, and will be far more tolerant toward the Afghan Taliban. And so I think you, you need to understand at least their view of the national interest before you can begin to, to sort out whether the, the, the army can be trusted or not. You know, you mentioned India. We have an email here from Anila Khan, who writes to us from Karachi in Pakistan, and she says, India is manipulating the Taliban to use them against Pakistan. India has to close its consulate in Afghanistan. They are prompting terrorism from there. Robert? Well, I, I think that uh, this captures the fundamental distrust that, that exists not only between uh, the, the Pakistan army and India, but uh, frankly, the, the people of Pakistan and, and India. And uh, I, I would say that uh, the Indians, in pursuing their own interests in Afghanistan, are perha perhaps not doing any of us a great favor because they're feeding this fundamental uh, distrust and, and paranoia which exists within Pakistan and makes the uh, uh, some in Pakistan, to include the army, even more reluctant than they, uh, they, than they otherwise would be uh, to cooperate with the government in Kabul. Okay, let's go to the phones. Uh, we have a caller from Florida. Come in Florida. Go ahead with your question. The question is why you cannot use the U.S. citizens, scholars that can be okay. uh, can be a great help to us to bring peace in, and make run the dialogue. All right, we got that. Let me put that question to Robert Grenier. Well, I, I think uh, perhaps Professor Shafkat uh, represents precisely what the, the, the caller is, is recommending. Uh, yes, there is a, is a wonderful wellspring of Pakistani-American uh, talent uh, here in the United States, and uh, I would like to, to see them mobilized to a far greater extent uh, to help the, the country of their origin and at the same time promote the interests of their own country. Dr. Shafkat, we've also got an email here from Saida uh, Sahamama writing to us from Pakistan. She says, this is not Pakistan's internal war. Pakistan is fighting the war for the whole world. At this time, the whole world should be standing with Pakistan. Uh, is there any reason to believe that the whole world is not standing with Pakistan? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that Pakistanis feel that they've been used time and again by the West and particularly by the United States. This is part of the trust deficit that exists between uh, Pakistan and the United States, right? Uh, we've seen this before. Uh, the last time around during the 1980s, there was a very similar um, uh, aid that was conditioned, of, uh, U.S. aid that was conditioned on Pakistan not developing nuclear weapons. Well, yet again, now we have U.S. aid conditioned on X, Y, Z. Uh, criteria. So, there, yes, I think there's a great deal of suspicion in Pakistan that continues to exist. Okay, we have another caller. This is Ashbak calling us from the United Kingdom. Ashbak, uh, go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you. Yeah, my name is Ashbak. I'm calling from Nottingham, England. My question is uh, to the speakers that uh, why America is not 
doing anything, uh, people who are funding Taliban, uh, while they know who they are, because they got uh, intelligence that uh, they, they've been funded from uh, not individual people, but the countries. And they haven't condemned them or they haven't done anything about it. Well, thank so you. Why, why is that, please? Okay, thank you for your question. In fact, that uh, goes directly to an email we just received from Hassan in Sweden who says, who asks rather, what is the CIA doing to stop the flood of money that comes from the Middle East to the Taliban? Robert, I think you're best qualified to answer that. Well, yes, I, I think that there's a great deal that's, that's being done. Uh, I'm not sure how effective it is in all cases, in all cases quite frankly. Uh, there has been um, a great deal that has d been done uh, by the United States uh, unilaterally uh, in terms of trying to track the, the sources of these funds, and also a great deal that has been done cooperatively, particularly with uh, cooperating governments in the, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, to try to, uh, to make sure that uh, banking mechanisms and hawala mechanisms are not being used to, to move money uh, into the wrong hands. Uh, that said, you know, terrorism is a cash and carry business. And uh, for the most part, it's, it's a cash-based business. Uh, it involves uh, the movement of, of physical money. They often don't use the, the banking system. Uh, couriers are, are employed to, uh, to bring money from uh, donors to uh, recipients in, uh, in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And so it's a very, very difficult thing to actually cut off. Okay, we have another. You know, one, one other thing, um, we don't talk about the support that, for example, Saudi Arabia gives to some of these extremist groups and the structures that support them. Um, as far as I know, nothing has been done about that. Well, we have a caller from Saudi Arabia on the line right now. Go ahead with your question, sir. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask you, distinguished panel, that I think this is more of a class struggle. We have a global class struggle. This problem of pa Taliban in Pakistan is similar to the problems we have in South America. All the revolutions we have, the drug money, et cetera, some, some things that are happening in Somalia as well. So why don't the rich nations come up with a creative solution to this problem. I think uh, this is where well, we are painting it as Islamic terrorism, except that's just a localized influence. But okay, I really we got the question. An equitable we got the question. distribution of wealth. Thank you. The that's Taliban right. and other extremists are absolutely exploiting class uh, sentiments and uh, class exploitation, absolutely, there's no doubt about that. But I want to be very clear, the Taliban are a very conservative, regressive force. They have no solution, really, to the genuine grievances of, the, of, of poor people in Pakistan. So let's not mistake their exploiting certain sentiments out there with them being the actual answer. Um, and that's why I will say again that the real way to diffuse, the ultimate way to diffuse the Taliban and other extremists is to build up a prosperous, stable, democratic Pakistan. Robert Grunier, do you believe the U.S. is in this for the long run? Yes. Uh, well, I hope that they're in it for, for the long run. Uh, I, I think that the recent developments in Afghanistan uh, have given the, the Americans pause. Uh, I think it, it is true that there is a, a, it's a national characteristic, if you will, uh, of Americans that I think they have a, a rather uh, short attention span. And also, maybe more fundamentally, uh, Americans like to see a problem, they like to contain that problem, and then they want to solve the problem, and preferably earlier rather than, than later. And uh, I think that's part of what we're struggling with right now in Afghanistan. Uh, at the end of the day, we can't solve the problem in Afghanistan. We can, we hope, help Afghans to solve their own problems. Right. That's going to take a lot of time. Americans are not patient. Let me ask you this. Um, do you believe that the American government is aware of where the financing comes from for the Taliban fighters in Pakistan? I think the short answer to that is is probably no. I, I'm sure that there are indications that there are wealthy donors, for instance, who are providing money which is finding its way uh, either intentionally or not into the hands of militants. Uh, I suspect that there, there are resources that are being shared between the Afghan and, and the, the Pakistani uh, Taliban. Uh, but again, I don't think it requires large sums of money in order for them to sustain their operations. Dr. Shafgat, I want to get very quickly, we have just about a minute left mm -hmm. to this email, and this is Ahmed Sayed writing from Hong Kong. He says, the Pakistani government is the one to blame. Pakistani politicians are horrendously corrupt. They are all Western puppets who are penetrating their presence deeper and deeper day by day in Pakistan. Pakistani politicians certainly have their share of the blame. But again, we need to focus not on personalities, but on process. Uh, it's frankly, it should be irrelevant whether Zardari is in power or somebody else, as long as there's a democratic process that's followed. Dr. Saha Shafkat, thanks for joining us. Robert Grenier, thank you for being with us as well. That's and welcome. thank you for watching. Remember, you can follow the show updates on Twitter and send us your questions and comments to us on the program. On the next show, the plight of Iraqi asylum seekers. Will they be able to stay in their adopted countries or do they face forced repatriation and an uncertain future? We'll see you the next time.